Good Friday afternoon. Welcome into the Illini Inquirer podcast. It's Jeremy Warner, and joining me today is Mike Latulip because we're going to get people ready for a big weekend of transfer official visits as Illinois has, a, so far that we know, three big transfers uh, coming in for official visits over the next several days. Uh, but they also have added a commitment, Trey White, out of Louisville. And, of course, they're going for A.J. Store and some other guys as well. So, Mike, we are in the middle of all of this. So uh, if, if people want the up-to-date, like what's happening, the, the buzz, Derek Piper's got that covered on the site. We're going to talk about the fits. We're going to talk about the roster that Brad Underwood is building. And, boy, Mike, in the next several weeks, uh, it'll all come to fruition. So it's exciting. It is. And we get these separate waves, right? It's You get the first portal wave around the start of the NCAA tournament because some teams have their seasons that are over. And then it picks up, you know, after kind of each weekend. And and now we're where we are the week following the, the national championship. And now visits can start happening. And it's felt quiet just in terms of commitments. But now you start to see more crystal balls and and those visits typically lead to to commitments, so it should be should be an exciting uh, next few weeks. Yeah, that dead period lifted today, so now all the official visits happening, and it's kind of kind of reminds you of the prep recruiting with the official visits with football, especially how there's such a, a rush to get get them on campus. So for Illinois to get three guys in the next several days, I think is a really good sign because it means you're probably one of the priority schools. Before we dive into all this, Mike, I got to ask you about a Final Four that that you attended, uh, as well as. Kentucky has a new coach and in, in Mark Pope and John Calipari is the Arkansas uh, coach. So I know you're in Phoenix, man. Uh, UConn just uh, continued to declare its dominance on college basketball. So thoughts from that? Yeah, man. No, it was it was a fun weekend. It's, you know, I think people, a lot of people be like, why did you go down to the Final Four? It's, you know, a lot of my friends are in the coaching profession. Uh, so everyone kind of cascades down on one place. And that's a great opportunity for me to just kind of knock out four, five, six birds with with one stone, um, not have to travel around during the year, but it's fun. Everybody goes down there. No one really has a plan. You know, you run in different coaches and you're like, hey, what are you doing tonight? And they're like, I don't know. What are you doing? And then it's everybody just kind of bounces around from Phoenix to Scottsdale. And um, but, you know, it's a it's a OK place to have a final four. I think I'm more excited for Indy in a couple of years, not just because I live here, but San Antonio, too. It's just everything's right there. Um and but yeah, saw Mark, Mark Pope when I was down there, you know, with the field of 68 guys and, um, you know, saw a lot of those coaches walking around. So it's it's a bizarre mix of like, hey, you're seeing people. And then the other side of it is like whether it's like a fired staff or like a GA that just is, got done with his, you know, the GA side of things. You, you know, there's a manager. It's like all these people are looking for jobs. Yeah. Too. So it's like a it's like half networking, half pleasure so it's um it's an interesting it's an interesting time but it's a lot of fun where does uh this UConn team rank among the best teams you've ever seen see it, this has obviously been a, a topic of discussion uh over the past few weeks I and it's hard to do it right because you when you think about like the the Bill Russell Celtics right <laughs> how would they fare against a team today and like do you base it off of if those two play today or do you base it off of how good they were relative to their competition and that's why i i think that uconn team is one of the best that i've ever seen um the, they are the most dominant that have that have played in the ncaa tournament uh just based off the point differential but you're watching that purdue game and i'm down there in in phoenix and people are asking me they're like what do you think for the national championship? And I think the world of Purdue, I think, I think Purdue's a heck of a team. I think Edie's incredible. I think, and I was like, they don't have a chance, man. They're not be, no one's beating this team. Um, you know, and it's, it's not only just their guard play and their, their discipline spacing and, and what they do offensively. It's, it's clinging. You have one of the best defenders, I think in the last, I don't know, 20, 25 years in college basketball that is sitting back there and, um, you know, then you can put a freshman and Steph Castle on anybody and he holds up. I mean, it's just like when Cam Spencer is like your maybe your fourth best guy, that's you're 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 usually in, in pretty good shape. So they're up there. They're up there for me, they're up there with you know, the probably the 18 Villanova team, um, certainly the Florida teams back then, the 2012 Kentucky team, 
Yeah. And you know, 09 North Carolina was was a really good team as well. So um, and I'm speaking more just here in the last 15, 20 years. You want to start getting way back, that's a whole different conversation just based off of eras and yeah. and style of play. Uh the coaching carousel, uh Calipari to Arkansas. And sounds like Chin Coleman and Orlando Antigua, former line assistants, going with him from Kentucky. Uh, and then Mark Pope. Uh, it looks like he was third on the list, potentially. Dan Hurley uh, and uh, Scott Drew say no to that job. And and Mark Pope, former Kentucky player, and Rick Pitino gets the job. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it was a bit shocking. Um, but shocking, I think, relative to the conversations that were being had leading up to it, right? I think if you soft-launched Mark Pope two or three years ago, and said, "Hey, you never know. Like, uh, could, you know, former Kentucky guy. He's in. You give people a little bit time to to process it, but it felt pretty. Uh, I think you got the visceral reaction you got last night because of how sudden it felt, right? Like it when you when you're thinking Dan Hurley at 10 a.m. and then you get you know Mark Pope at 7 p.m. That's that's especially for that Kentucky fan base. That's just going to lead to a lot of. Um, uh, it's going to be it's going to be underwhelming, right?" But this is the thing I'll say about Mark Pope. Mark Pope's a really good coach. Yes. Um, really good coach. Utah Valley State was in the dumpster um, before he got there. And then you and then BYU, he's taken to the tournament a few times. He's had, you know, pretty solid seating, uh, transitioned them well to the Big 12. Here's the thing. Here's what's going to happen, okay? Mark Pope, uh, like I said, really good coach. He's going to have the resources to get really good players. And he is going to get those really good players. And when he gets those really good players, they're going to run really good stuff because that's that's what Mark Pope teams do. My worry, and not necessarily my worry, but the challenge of that job, and I'm not saying that that Mark Pope isn't aware of it. He played there, right? And he felt it. I heard him talking on the field of 68 where he goes, okay, well, we're about to play in the national championship. We're in the semifinal and we can feel it, right? We are a complete failure if we don't win this whole title. So there's no question he's felt that, that fishbowl, that pressure cooker environment, but he's never been in a management environment like that. And that that is what that Kentucky job is beyond, you know, winning championships and all those expectations. It's how you manage parents. It's how you manage agents all those things, you're CEO at Kentucky. And if you're not used to that, that can be a big time adjustment. So that's more, that's more what I'm, what I'm looking for, for him. We're waiting and see to see if he goes and wins championships there, but at a base level, that's a really good coach that I think will have success there, but the amount of success is going to be predicated on how, how well he does with those other areas. All right, Mike, the people tuning in want to hear about Illinois, but I thought it was, it was worth it talking about those college basketball topics with you. Trey White is a committed to Illinois, uh, a guy we hadn't talked about a lot here, but Illinois kind of worked this stealthily, and they get their guy, a former top 40 prospect, has started 55 games at the high major level uh, at Louisville last year, obviously a bad team, averaged 12 and 6. Uh, what do you think of what he brings to Illinois, and, and what do you think of his upside? Yeah, I think the more I watch him, the more I like him. Mm-hmm. Um, I always get texts, right? Whenever a guy enters the portal, whenever a guy commits to Illinois, I have a lot of people that text me and say, what do you think of the fit, right? Or what do you think of the fit? Or, hey, this guy's under the portal. Does he fit at Illinois? And my my answer is always, what's the plan? Because mm-hmm. the plan will dictate the fit. And And when I watch Trey White, you can see why this Illinois staff likes him. And it's the positional size, right? He's six seven. He's got a solid build, and that is a good starting point, regardless. But then when you dive into how Illinois has morphed their offense, and how that has definitely become a, a selling point and a pitch, and has allowed you to actually go out and recruit for fit more than previous years, because you have something stable there and something tangible. I, I watch Trey White, and we'll just stick with the offense. And I'll, I'll give this one example. But really good in backdowns last year at six seven. It was probably one of one of the only efficient things that Louisville did offensively last year. They just didn't do it, I thought, quite enough. Uh, you know, I'll give an example here. So when you look at synergy, there were 30 situations where he ended a back down in a field in a 
field goal attempt, let's call it, or a scoring opportunity. And Synergy had that. I went back. I found more than that. There were a couple more than that that weren't labeled as as back downs. But 30 different times he did that last season. Okay, five or six of those he was fouled on. And then he was 11 for 25 from the field uh, on those back downs, 44%, which is which is pretty good. But the important part is he started the year two for 12. Hmm. And they did it in different ways. They up screened for him. They just had him face cut into the post. And then once he started to get more comfortable and was doing it more often, started using his frame, six, seven, getting through guys, finishing through guys, finishing strong. And he finished the season nine for 13 on a nine for 13 stretch on back downs. Like he was tough to handle down there. And, and I'll say this too. He had 3% turnover rate in those back downs, which means a lot of that single coverage, you didn't have to pass out of double teams, but he's at least taking care of it and getting high percentage shots. So that at a base level, I can absolutely see why they view Trey, Trey white as a fit. And I absolutely see why he can have some success at Illinois. Yeah, so what you're suggesting there is potential booty ball option, right? Like he's not a proven passer facilitator quite yet. Um, There is a baseline of shooting too, right? Like I know he shot under 30% last year, just under that from three. But catch and shoot, Mike, I know you've mentioned he was better than that. And listen, I didn't watch Louisville basketball this year, but they couldn't have been running good stuff, right? I mean, so what are the areas you think the staff can get him better, develop him on the offensive side of the ball? Yeah, look, and this is an overarching theme for for Trey White. Development is predicated on your environment, right? You have a better chance of developing if you have a good environment. And I think there's untapped potential with Trey because I just don't think he's gotten a lot of good coaching in his in his college career. So now you put him in an environment where he does get that. And I, I don't know, I think one of the main areas, if you want to look at like, the the low hanging fruit for him. If you surround him with good defenders or just competent defenders, and he can be a good defender, right? I, at least when I watch him, I can tell he cares on that end. And we'll show we'll show in the film. Uh, he was just on an island because you mentioned they weren't running much offensively. They weren't doing much defensively either. Their ball screen coverage was horrible. It was just bigs that were kind of in drop, but then just left. I mean, I've I've shown clips before where we've seen that. That was a lot of what they did. So it puts you like when you look on Synergy, he's a below average defender, but then you pull up the clips and it's him fighting over a ball screen and he can't square up because the big's already abandoned and guys are shooting layups. But that's on you per Synergy. Hmm. So like that's why you have to watch the film and go through it, because I think that if you like I said, you surround him with competent defenders. Now he can actually utilize his size. I talked about Marcus Damask. Marcus Damask, not the best guarding in space. Like a lot of these six, 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 seven guys aren't, but you get them in close quarters. Now they can really utilize that size. So that's the first thing. That's the first area of development that he can improve on. The second area is the shooting. Like you mentioned, I talked about the catch and shoot, but you know, a lot of times for, you know, what, what great coaching does is it eliminates the negative aspects of your game. It's not about pushing you to do more. It's about finding those things to eliminate to to be able to make you more efficient. And for him last year, okay, 29%, I think is what ended up being from three, uh, something along those lines. He was two for 12 from three off the dribble. Okay. So if you just say, hey, eliminate the off the dribble threes, stick to catch and shoot, doing what you do best, catch and shoot, uh, you know, cuts, back downs, he'll become a more efficient player. I mean, you just take those 12 off the dribble threes last year, he's 34% from three. And this is like a whole different conversation. Like we're talking about how he's, you know, a good shooter. So mm-hmm. that those are the two areas of, of improvement. But a lot of that comes from one, like obviously the kid buying into it, but two, being in an environment that allows you to, um, you know, accept, accentuate your abilities because your coaches are putting you in a position to be successful. Is this a guy that plays mostly the four, Mike? Can he play the three? Because I'm, I'm thinking of how does he play with Luke Goody? Uh, how does he play with um, Ty Rogers, potentially? How, how does he play with potentially an A.J. Store? Like, how, how do you see him kind of being used? All that's going to be predicated on on matchups, right? I mean, we, we talk – I think we think so much about – positions offensively and if they're doing booty ball and read and react and that like you just it's more about your alignment and your you know your personnel on the floor 
you know, if, if it's, hey, we got Trey in back down, so let's surround him with different guys that can shoot, that can slash. Trey can also slash, so that's another point, too, where if you have another guy that can go into those back downs, Trey's a really good cutter. Um, so you can, you can see how the gears are kind of moving there when you think about fit. Um, but he's a guy that can play the four. He's a guy that I think can play the three. Like you can, if you want to call Luke Goody a four at times and him a three, sure. I mean, you can, you can, you can do that if you'd like. I mean, I think it's just, it's a matter of having a group on the floor that makes sense, having a group on the floor that fits. And sometimes that's not, you know, that's not always going to be denoted by, Certain, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Um, the fives are always a little bit more obvious, but one through four, when you have guys that are wings and guards, like they, they can be a bit in- interchangeable. All right, Mike, when we come back, let's talk about the official visitors. We got Kylan Boswell, Arizona guard, Notre Dame forward, Kerry Booth, and Toledo guard, Dante Maddox Jr., all taking official visits over the next several days to the University of Illinois. We'll talk about that after a quick break to hear from one of our great sponsors. This episode of the Illini Enquirer podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you do if you had an extra hour of your day? Go for a run, take a nap, read a book, show up for a friend? A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Illini today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Illini. All right, Mike, let's dive into these official visitors for Illinois. I want to shout out the 200 plus already on the live YouTube on a Friday afternoon. Appreciate you guys. Hit that like button, subscribe to us, hit the notifications bell as well. We'll try to get to some of your questions later on. If you got any super chats or anything, we'll try to get to those later on. But Mike, first of all, Kylan Boswell entered the transfer portal and he is immediately taking an official visit to Illinois. Of course, a Champaign area native and uh, Illinois has a need for a league guard. I think you and I both know they want to run more ball screen actions this year. Uh, so it was, he's a young guy. Uh, he's turning 19 next week. He's going to be a 19 year old junior. He's played on obviously a great program at Arizona had an up and down season ended on a down as he struggled. I think he scored under five points and, five of his last six games there. But what do you think of Kyle and Boswell, the player, and, and how he'd fit the program? Really, really good basketball player. Um, it's it's kind of crazy watching him play to think that he's as young as he is because I think he does have a, a mature game. And He looks like a grown man. He does. He's strong build. He moves his feet really well. And and I think he's, he's a Brad Underwood type of guy. I think when you watch him, just his competitive spirit – uh, the fire that he plays with his his overall demeanor, I think is is uh, is great, and that's that's something that you you can definitely see that kind of jumps out when you watch the film. And um, when I mentioned he's a really good basketball player, that's not just about production, right, or numbers, or points, or assists, or rebounds. It's just his awareness, and that's not just court vision, right? That's floor vision. I think he's a guy that is a really good cutter off the ball. I mean, you go back and watch their Michigan State game from earlier this year. Anytime Tyson Walker turned his head, anytime Trey Holloman, Jaden Akins turned their head, he was gone. He was beeline into the basket and got a lot of easy baskets out of that. So, um, but also good in ball screens too. He's good operating in the mid range. I think, you know, compared to this past season at Arizona, I think he'll have more space to operate at Illinois. Uh, You know, Balo. Valo's a really good player, the five man at Arizona, but I think he he took away at times the ability for some of these guys to get to that last layer of the rim because he's he's either down there posting or 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 kind of clogging up the lane uh, in a way. So um, he's Kylan's most successful early clock, right? When he was at Arizona, that's transition, secondary transition, and that's because of space. It's because Valo's trailing the play, right? So. Um, but he worked really well in ball screens with him too. And then being with a guy like Caleb Love, you better learn how to play off the ball because he's going to have the ball in his hands a ton. So the fact that he got exposure to kind of both sides of that, where he wasn't just, hey, Caleb Love, 
like like late game, they inbounded the ball to Kylan Boswell and had him bring the ball up. Like they, he was kind of their stabilizing force. And to have that while also learning how to be a basketball player off the ball, he had a lot of that instinctually. But I think these past two years have helped him in that regard. I think, you know, and then the the last point I'll make too is just when you look at his field goal percentage, I think it was 39% last year. And I went back and I pretty much watched every two point field goal attempt that he had because I just want to understand where he was getting them from, why that percentage is a little bit lower. And again, part of that spacing, like at times he had to stop short and shoot kind of quick floaters because the lane was so congested. Um, now there are some, some off the bounce uh, stuff that maybe he can, I don't want to say take out of his game, but limit um, to be more efficient. Um, and maybe that comes with the more space that I mentioned. So again, he was a, he was a kind of a stabilizing force for Arizona. And I think when you talk about getting a lead guard and bringing a guy in that fits that mold of what you're looking for, he can be that for Illinois as well. I mean, we're talking about a former five-star prospect. Like this is a huge deal. Like Kyle, Kyle Boswell, I think would be a, a big addition if, if you can land him. And I feel like they're in a good spot here, Mike, but like you got potentially two more years of eligibility of him. And again, he's just 19 where it's like, this guy can mature. So I, what were some of the struggle points for him last year and, and and how good do you think he can be? How much improvement do you think he has in front of him? Yeah, I mean, I think just because of of Caleb Love and Jaden Bradley, two two really good players, I think they were just like Kylan could kind of disappear at times. Um, right? And and take somewhat of a backseat to them. Um, but you could tell when he did have the ball in his hands, that's kind of the part that I was impressed by was like when he had the ball in his hands, he wasn't very like deferential like he was like he he when he had the ball in his hands it was like I'm the guy yeah. and that's that's the type of mentality that you need um to to be able to be a threat to the defense and and so that was this guy, this guy Mike who's really succeeded with USA basketball like he's played at the highest level he's played for Arizona team that was competing you know we thought potentially for a national championship yeah he has every right to to feel um you know to feel confident in his abilities and so we, you know, another area we just talked about was the two point percentage. So I won't, I won't like rehash that. Yeah. Uh, I just, I just think for for a guy like Kylan, I given all the factors, right, playing on a team that was pretty much hanging out in the top ten in Kempom the past two seasons, really, um, and, and was was a number one seed or a number two seed this year. Uh, you know, to be able to to bring in a guy like that at that age while still still having years left with him, I think it would be one of the best gets in the portal. Um, I'm not talking about just for Illinois. I'm talking about nationally. I think I think he can make that type of impact. I think he's a guy that has all league type upside next year. Um, that's there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, it, but it's all a matter of of how the pieces fit together. And I think I think Illinois sounds like they're they're in a good position. And, um, you know, if he does end up making it to, to Champaign next year, it would be, be pretty exciting. Yeah, Mike. And uh, what do you make of Illinois going more towards a traditional league guard uh, a year after not doing it? Does that just suggest, hey, Marcus Damascus is hard to find again? Yeah, I, I think that's that's the thing that you run into, right? Is it, hey, is it a system thing or is it a Marcus Damas thing? And I think you could rely on Marcus Damas doing that in the system that much because it was Marcus Damas. Now you still found a lot of efficiency with that. That doesn't mean that you do it as much as you did it with Marcus, but still having guys that you can go to for that, like a Trey White. I think Kylan's <laughs> Kylan could do it too. Yeah, Kylan's got a booty enough to do a booty. Yeah, I mean, and, and the other thing too, I mean, we'll get to Dante Maddox, I'm sure, but another guy that I don't know what Kylan Boswell's wingspan is, but he's six two and looks again like he has a six seven, six eight wingspan he's got really long arms it's the reason why he had one and a half steals per game this year um, i was gonna say like he could be a huge upgrade defensively like on ball defense was a huge concern for illinois last year i would imagine he's an upgrade yeah he is and 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 so again like a lot of reasons to be excited about about a kid like that um but but yeah i think they going to more ball screens right when things break down or when when it's late game and um because that that was what was tough late game for them. You obviously had the booty ball, but it wasn't necessarily the strength of a Terrence Shannon or the strength of Marcus Damask to just say, Hey, come up, step up five ball screen and go and play and read and react. Um, I think they'll do a little bit of both this year that, you know, and having a blend is, 
is good if you can remain efficient with it. And uh, so that's why you recruit guys that you can, you know, if you want to go, let's say they do go primarily booty ball, you got a really good cutter in Kylan Boswell. You got a really good shooter in Kylan Boswell to, to, to help complement that. Um, and then if you want a guy coming off a of ball screen, so you can do that as well. So you're getting guys that are, are multifaceted um, in a sense. So uh, I think all that's positive. Yeah, Callum Boswell arrives Friday as we're recording this. Also, Kerry Booth, Notre Dame forward, another young guy, still 18, uh, going to turn 19 this coming year. Stretch forward, former top 60 recruit, 6'10", thin at 205, uh, but kind of raw, Mike, but, but you, the, tan, the talent is tantalizing, uh, if I can get that out. like, What do you think of, of Kerry Booth? Uh, who's still got a lot of upside, but uh, still got to see what his floor is after averaging, what, six and four last year for Notre Dame. Yeah, I, I think another kid, when you watch the film, you can tell is about the right things. And, you know, we're 26 minutes into the pot, and I want to I mention that, where, you know, you had a team comprised last year of guys that were, you know, Marcus Damas, Justin Harmon, Quincy Garrier, the guys that came in, um, even Amani, Dre Gibbs, Allhorn, like those were guys that were about the right things. And that helps your process. That buy-in, guys buy in quicker. You see success quicker. And and I watch Kerry Booth, and I just I see a kid that's about the right things. And you know he's still like you said, he's super raw. People have to understand that. Um, I think we've grown so accustomed to grad transfers mm -hmm. the past few years, where you're basically getting these finished products. So when you look at their body of work in college, it's going to be a lot of what they are. Um, when they play at Illinois and for, for a guy like Kerry, like this is a guy that I definitely think can make an impact next season, but there's no doubt this is a long-term play. Um, you know, you're, you're betting, you're betting more on the long-term term element here. So uh, as a player, right. Teams sagged off him last year. Uh, he took almost 123s, 63% of his, of his shots were, were from three and, Look, I've seen the the comparisons to Coleman. Um, I I don't I don't see that now. Obviously, uh, Coleman's a much better facilitator yeah. than and, and mover of the ball than than Kerry is. That's not to say Kerry can't get there because I mean you got a dad that played in the NBA. You got all the the tools, right? I think he's still figuring out. Um, you know, he's still figuring himself out a little bit uh, just in terms of his body. And and I think I think Fletch would help out big time with yeah, that. You, you texted me the other day. It was the perfect line. It was the, he's, he's like a baby deer. He's like a fawn out there. Yeah, no, he is. But the crazy thing is he's 6'10 and he's quick. Yeah. And and that's almost more so just, you know, he would they would trap a little bit at, at Notre Dame. And his reaction and his burst, like getting into those traps and being so – he definitely has an over seven-foot wingspan. Um, that canvas, right, it, you got to be salivating if you're if you're this, this staff and if you're Fletch because, um, you know, getting him on the right path with the right footing and, you know, he's got – he definitely has the skill. And the last thing I'll mention too is, you know, I talked about him not being necessarily the facilitator that, that Coleman Hawkins is. But this is still a kid who was a freshman last year that played 33 games, I think it was. He had 25 turnovers, hmm. right? So what that tells me is that he's a, he, he is coachable and he will play his role because guys that are high turnover or negative assist to turnover, which he was, he didn't have a ton of assists, but he didn't have a ton of turnovers either, which means that, hey, I am catch and shoot. I am straight line drive. I'll, I'll make some... I'll make some things shake off of cuts. I'll get offensive rebounds and putbacks, and I'm not going to try to overextend myself and become a net negative, right? If I'm already not shooting the ball well, I don't want to be turning it over too. So that is super promising to me. Um, I saw that turnover number, and I'm like, that's awesome. Because a lot of guys with that amount of playing time that he got, you know, he was 20-ish minutes a game, 20-plus minutes a game. Um, to, you know, to only have 25 turnovers on the season is – means that you know he's smart uh he can buy into his role and he can play within himself and that always gives you a chance to develop yeah for people that don't know his dad is calvin booth the former penn state star played in the nba and is now the general manager of the denver nuggets who uh the illinois uh coaches have a connection to uh from their staff so um 
I think they're sitting well. Colorado State's going to get the other visit here early this weekend. Uh, so it feels like Illinois is in a pretty good spot here. How do you think he would compliment Merez Johnson, big athletic rim runner, who's now the Illinois Mr. Basketball this year? Uh, congratulations to Merez on that. Amani Hansberry, Trey White. Like, how, how do you think he kind of compliments those other front court pieces Illinois has at this moment? Yeah, I think, you know, forget the percentages. I think, I think he can shoot above 29%. From three, so I think he can be a guy that can space the floor a little bit. I think he has room to grow defensively for sure, um, just like most freshmen, you know, that are about to be sophomores do. But uh, it, I think you can play him at the four. You can play Marez at the five. You can play Amani at the five. You can play Amani at the four. You can play like you can move him around a little bit. He played primarily on the perimeter for for Notre Dame last season. So um, a guy like him that you know, think about Quincy in a way where if you're going to go to booty ball, if you're going to go to, um, to ball screens, like this is a guy that can cut off the ball that can, you know, 45 cut to the basket that can back cut um, because he's mobile like that. Uh, so you can put him in a, in a variety of spots, but again, going back to Trey white and all these guys, it's what spot is best in order for him to be successful. That's probably at the four. Um I would say so. Quincy Guerrier uh, role, right? I mean, he's not he's not physical. He doesn't have the Quincy's body, but like that role of spreading the floor and being a finisher at the rim. Totally, no, Enjoy. totally. And, and and I think I think too, I think for him and Boswell, both younger guys. I mean, if there's going back to Boswell real quick, I think Boswell with his length and with his physicality, um, he's a guy that can could and should have more than two rebounds a game. Um, part of that's Ballo and Larson and Johnson and all the guys around Arizona kind of eating those up. But these are two guys that I think can, you know, if they, if they rebound the way they're capable of, they can help out this team a ton. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think for, for Kerry, you can put him in different spots, but I, I think it's a guy that you don't want to like overload his plate, uh, as soon as he gets to Illinois, I think he's, he's going to grow because look at Coleman, I, you know, you got to think about it. Think about if Coleman, what think about what Coleman Hawkins turned into. Mm -hmm. And think about if you just looked at Coleman's freshman year stats and he transferred to your program, you'd be like, what are we really getting? You know, so long term plays are good because we've seen at Illinois, if guys stick around, they develop into pretty good players. All right. Last guy that we know for sure is going to visit in the next couple of days, probably Sunday to Monday. Dante Maddox Jr., Toledo guard, grad transfer, the only guy that doesn't have multiple years of eligibility here. He's taking a trip to Louisville first. He's got five visits he'd like to take. Uh, he told uh, Dushan London of 24-7 Sports. But uh, I, I know you like him, Mike. Why, why do you like the fit with Illinois? Uh, you need guys that can make shots. Uh, and and Dante Maddox can do that. I, I talked to a number of coaches that uh, coached against him this year. Uh, and they really liked him. Uh, they liked his ability to take and make shots take and make tough shots at times too like where you know when things break down and it's a late shot clock like having a guy that can kind of go get one is is huge i think like i've said before i think in terms of off off ball movement and shooting off off ball um and off movement i think it's i think he'll he would be their best off ball shooter since since plumber mm -hmm. um like he's just he has that type of dexterity and and his ability to be comfortable shooting uncomfortable shots and so that alone is is exciting and then again like i said with boswell uh, i love his length too i think that's going to help where he's not like the quickest guy um but what he lacks in quickness he makes up for in length and that that's really helpful because we talked about it before right i was a guy that was call it blessed or not blessed with a negative wingspan mm -hmm. so in order for me to be there to contest I had to be closer to you, which puts me at a disadvantage to guard the ball. So a guy like Maddox, especially coming up to this level, when you got a six, eight wingspan and you can be there on the contest and still give yourself room to be able to get away and slide and cut off angles that helps you get to that next, you know, make an impact on the defensive end. And then when you talk about Boswell and Maddox, like in gaps and getting steals, like that's, that's all on the table too. So, um, this this doesn't strike me as a situation where it's like, hey, you know what? Just go get talent, you know, and and like this is pretty deliberate the way they're putting this thing together. If you're the Illini staff and you got Boswell and say you're able to close on him this weekend, then Maddox 
comes and visit and you're pushing for AJ store. What's your pitch to Maddox when other schools are like, Hey, you might be our one, number one, number two option. Yeah. I mean, I think you've seen how much success Brad Underwood's had with, with guys like a Dante Maddox. And I just say, I'll just say guards and wings. Mm-hmm. Um, you, Kofi was obviously an all American, but what he was able to do with IO and Terrence and, um, and, you know, they play a style that, and, and, and not to say that, you know, Louisville chucks threes. They're going to chuck threes because that's what College of Charleston did. Um, so there's definitely going to be a pitch there. All these schools are going to have pitches for him, but the kid's from Illinois, right? And and I think being able to – I'm not saying that that's the reason, right? Uh, he wants to play for his in-state school. But he's definitely aware of what Illinois has been doing and how much they've been winning and how much that helps you – get to the next level, right? When you play in a winning environment, with, in a winning culture, Look at Cam play in the NCAA tournament, that's all huge. Look at Cam Spencer. He's a perfect example of that, right? Yep. All you got to do I've, – I've said it for years, man. I mean, you know, people want to go places for production. Go to a place that wins, get the NCAA tournament, and all you got to do in the Elite Eight and the Final Four is just play your game. Yep. Play your game. Cam Spencer didn't have to do – Cam Spencer didn't do anything that he hasn't been doing – the last four years at Rutgers, at Loyola, Maryland, uh, he goes out there and and goes to UConn and plays Cam Spencer's game, and now he's probably going to be drafted. So that's yeah. just moral of the story win. It's probably a lesson Trey White learned going from USC that makes the tournament to Louisville, which is a disaster. Now he's like, hey, I got to go someplace uh, that's better than that. Uh, Crocolot actually asked a question that I want to ask. Can we get Mike's take on the staff taking looking to take guys with a couple years of eligibility left? And I was going to ask you about that, Mike. What, what are you learning about Brad Underwood's roster building approach this offseason? Because to me, this looks like outside of Maddox and maybe AJ Store, who's got multiple years of eligibility, but maybe he's only a one year guy, they are really looking for guys who can make a multi year impact here. That's the first thing that jumps out to you, right? Is the multi year guys. I mean, we, we've talked a bunch about last year and how they constructed that team to really lend itself to Coleman and, and Terrence being you know, one and done after that, after that season. Uh, and, and they, they constructed it accordingly. Now, you know, now it's, now it's about, you know, finding that balance of still win now while also positioning yourselves for the future. And I think they're, I think they're doing a good job of that with the guys that they're, with the guys that they're going after um, because continuity still wins in college basketball. We've, we've seen that that's been on display. No matter how much talent you get out of the portal, um, continuity still wins and how quickly guys buy in what type of guys you have um, now more than ever character matters because you put yourself behind the eight ball quick. If you, you know, if you're starting from zero, not, I'm not saying zero, but starting near the ground floor rebuilding. Um, if you have guys that are going to, uh, you know, throw a wrench into that process, that's it's, it's going to be hard to, to win consistently. So, um, but I, but I think there is an overarching theme too with like, there's like untapped would be the word that I would use for a few of these guys. And for different reasons, Trey white is untapped because I just don't think he's had a ton of good coaching in his, in his college career. And Illinois is going to give him that, that are giving him an environment to be successful. Kylan Boswell, I think is, you know, untapped in a way where, you know, I think he's a guy that plays really well in space. And at times last year with Arizona, with Balo down low, you didn't have much of that. Now you have a guy that you can, you know, hand the ball off to and, and have him play in ball screens and operate in more space. And I think you can get more out of him that way. Kerry Booth untapped just in the sense of like raw, mm-hmm. like untapped physically. Um, right. So, so you can build with that. Like that has been the theme for me as I look at what they're, what they're doing in the portal. And then I touched on it already, just the offensive system. Now you have one to, to market. Now you have one to recruit to. And, and I think they've done a good job of that because each one of these guys that they bring in, fits that system in some way, shape, or form. Um, so all, all that, I think, contributes to kind of what we're seeing here uh, with with Brad and the staff's approach here in the offseason. I don't know if you're going to go three for three with these guys, Boswell, Booth, Maddox, but if you do, you're a good team. Like You, you should be yeah. a really good team yeah. next year. How important is A.J. Store to this entire offseason? Um, because he's one of the top transfers available – Uh, Arkansas, I would imagine now is going to be a very major player here. Kansas is a major player. Uh, He's going to get one of the biggest NIL deals of all these transfers that is out there. How important is he to to Illinois' offseason here, Mike? Look, I mean, AJ Store is super talented. 
there's there's no denying that um it's just always about especially now in this era it's about finding that balance to avoid diminishing returns mm -hmm. um that's 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 what it comes down to i think you you have to be sure on fit um the get talent and figure it out later philosophy is a horrible philosophy um it, it's just you it's it's risky um incredibly risky to just stockpile talent and just be like hey we're gonna roll it out and and figure it out because it's not like hey we got a great not like it was back in 2010 where you could say got a great recruiting class hey we'll see what happens this year and then we just keep building right because if it doesn't work out this upcoming year there's a chance you go back to square one again next year so I, I just, and that's not even mentioning the NIL side of it, which huge component of yeah. this. And that's not just with AJ Store; that's with everyone. Like, there's that's a real conversation because if what someone costs eliminates the ability to get these other two guys, um, and again, I'm not just saying no AJ Store, and I'm not just referring to like Boswell and Maddox. This is just a, a broader conversation where this isn't. Uh, you know, you can't dip into the luxury tax yeah. in, in college basketball. There's a finite amount of money. Uh, and and so I heard someone say the other day, and I thought it was a really good point. You know, if you have, there's all these schools that have all this NIL, right? And they, and some of it's just like a never ending faucet and they can go get whoever they want, pay them whatever they want. And uh, it's similar to baseball, right? Does baseball have a salary cap? No. Do the Dodgers and the Yankees win every year? No. No. So like, like the, Met, the Mets are terrible at it, right? Like the Mets are terrible at spending money. Exactly. So, I mean, I think that that is very similar to what we're seeing in college basketball is like continuity, coaching, all that. You can, you can get guys quicker and probably a little bit easier if you have the resources, but winning is still hard. So I know that was like a, a separate tangent, but look, if you feel like AJ, AJ store fits, what you're, you know, what you're trying to do, then, then by all means, but if he doesn't, you're, you know, you're, you're going to hinder your ability to, to progress and to, to win quicker, because if, if bringing him on eliminates the ability to get these other, you know, call it whoever, two other guys, like what's the cost benefit there? Um, do you think on the court he fits? Again, super talented freak athlete. Um, I, I thought Wisconsin was a really weird fit for him. Yeah. Uh, Cause I like, he's going to need to go somewhere like an Ole Miss or like, you know, somewhere that just kind of lets him go and lets him play. Like I think to, to tap out AJ stores potential, you got to really cater to AJ store. Like you got to, he's got to kind of be your guy and you got to run things through him constantly. And, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, no, because like I, I get people's hesitation with him because there's moments he can take you out of games a little bit, right? Like he has those those faults, but like I also have seen the talent. Like it's hard for me to get the Big Ten tournament out of my head, Mike. Seeing him up close, seeing what he did. Yeah. Like there aren't many players in college basketball or the Big Ten that that can do those things. And you've seen what I, he's not he's not Terrence Shan. Like they're different players, right? But like you see what that kind of wing can do for you, and how Illinois can develop and unlock it. Like, I, I just think he can be one of the best players in college basketball. And if you have a chance to get that guy, you go for it. But like, yes, you, you got to make sure that he's about the right things. Yeah. And, and, and look, I, the, the overarching theme here is, is, is the NIL. Like, you know, I, again, like I'm and this isn't an AJ store thing. The numbers that I'm hearing, <laughs> and I'm not talking about AJ Store. I'm, I mean, we've seen that's been public. Um, Omar Bello is have heard some big numbers from whether that's whether the sources are accurate or not. Like the numbers you're seeing, I've heard of some other numbers from players that absolutely should not be asking for eight hundred thousand dollars that are asking for eight hundred thousand dollars. And and so like, I, I don't know. I think and I think I think Illinois has got a cutoff point for for that stuff, right? It's like. No, no question. I think, I think, I think everyone does. Um, but it's just, again, it's a matter of figuring out if you're going to bring him on what that costs and what that, you know, doesn't allow you to do right. beyond that. Um, right. You pretty much are dealing with a salary cap here. So um, that's just the nature of the beast here. I wanted to ask you 
Also, Bo, if, if they uh, if they land Booth, do they go get in a, a five, a rim protecting five? Is that a need? And then you kind of think of, well, how's that affect the rest of the front court roster? Like, it seems like they are involved in talking to some rim protecting fives. Like, do you think that's a definite need for this team? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think so. I think they're going to get a five. Um, now, what type of five that is, we'll see. Um, I, I would not expect it to be a guy that's like, hey, we're going to throw the ball in the post right? 20 to 25 times a game. That's definitely not going to be the case. Um, is it going to be a five that can stretch, that can step out a little bit? Maybe that could help if you want to do some some booty ball or or even if you if you want to run pick and roll stuff and have a guy that can pop at the five. Um, you know, that's that's I think that's on the table too. Um, but I think the questions become defensively, right? Because I, you know, carry at the five would be tough next year, I, I think. Like that that would be tough defensively, much like it was for for Coleman, because Coleman was was more naturally a guy that had success guarding fours. So you know, you're going to need a rotational piece probably that you can put in. Um, but I just, because I as much as I love Merez, Mike, like he's a freshman, he's probably going to follow up. Right. Like they usually, that's have. usually what they deal with. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's usually what they deal with. So we'll, we'll see how it plays out because, you know, oftentimes you, this is just kind of the, the nature of college basketball where what your roster is today is not what your roster is going to be three days from now, five days from now, a week from now. So, um, We'll, we'll see how it plays out. But I would, I would imagine that they're not – even after this wave of guards and, and wings and fours, like I, I don't I, – I wouldn't imagine that they're done. How do you think all these targets that we're talking about impact the current roster or, or what we know of it right now? Like these these guys are all going to be like really interested in what Illinois is adding the next several weeks. How it impacts the current roster? We'll see, right? That's the thing. I mean, I, I think I've, I've come to learn that – like I said, every week is different. These situations are incredibly fluid. Uh, that's that's my like corporate way of of, ans- of answering that. And some guys will stay and compete, um, and some guys won't. And that's that's they have every right to be able to do that and leave and go somewhere else they think would be a better opportunity for them. So um, I, I think that this staff is mindful of that, that there certainly are guys that they want to make sure are on this team next year. And then that can develop because I think Coleman Hawkins is a really good, you know, case study there, um, use case or whatever you want to call it. Uh, what he was able to do developing in this program, developing in this system uh, and how this, this staff has the ability to mold things around these guys um, and have everybody kind of playing to their strengths at different times. And that's, that can be hard to do. So we'll see what it ends up being here. These next, these next couple of weeks. Um, it's just, it's a wild time of year. Uh, Cause we always have the first, the second, the third wave and how that affects your roster. It's, it's a, it's a day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute type thing. Last thing I want to bring up with you, Mike, cause I know a lot of fans feel this too. Like this is pretty cutthroat business, right. Of, of, looking for upgrades over guys you've recruited as preps and like it's worked really well for Illinois, but also it's the other side of player freedom of movement is the coaches also have the freedom to upgrade over you right away, but there is still value in the Luke goodies of the world, the Ty Rogers of the world. And I think a guy like Amani or, or Dre Gibbs Allhorn to have those guys in your program, to be those glues that, that connect the years as, as Coleman did, um, you know, this, this, this past year, um, so it's, it's just an interesting dynamic that we're all going through of the new era of college basketball. But Brad's been really aggressive in the portal. But I still think having a few of those guys here for multiple years, three years, maybe the rare four-year guy, I still think there's a lot of value in that. Yeah, there is. And and I think, you know, what's interesting is, and it's not just Brad Underwood, it's coaches all over the country. They get criticism for guys leaving, mm-hmm. right, or recruiting over guys but they would get equally as much criticism or more if they were losing. Right. So, right. Like you want to win. And, and Kentucky was a really good example of that this year. Like I was saying all year, I actually, I, I, I went back to a pod that we did in December and I was like, I'm really curious to see what happens with Kentucky because Man. they're young and, and that does not play well in March, especially in this day and age when everyone else is getting older. Um, so you look at John Cal, Cal Perry and it's, it's, 
hey, man, I won a national championship in 2012 with a bunch of freshmen. I mean, Deron Lamb, there were a couple other guys that were that were a little bit older, but for the most part, they were freshmen. And so he's probably like, well, how did I win a national championship? I did it with younger guys. Get younger guys, get into the league. And that that just doesn't that doesn't work nowadays. And mm-hmm. so I think he <laughs> I think last year it was it was put a team around Terrence and Coleman that can that can definitely make a second weekend. Check that one off the list, okay? Quiet the quiet the people on that front, and then now it's it's I think getting back to okay, we have a formula we see that works, especially offensively, um, and now we can recruit and and straddle, you know, a little bit of age with a little bit of of development, and so that we can can build an even more sustaining. Uh, program. I mean, this has been like the most successful program in the Big Ten the last five years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they've earned, they should have earned the trust of, I think, everyone to understand like, hey, they know what they're doing. Um, and and no matter who you put on that roster, even, la- even last year, the 22-23 season, that was somewhat of a disaster and they won 20 games. That's right. Right? So, you know, I, I, I think – it's a weird time. You're right. Uh, guys are getting recruited over. And I think the one thing that I, I would appreciate as a player is just honesty. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, it's funny, gross, my sophomore year gross came up to me. Um, it was on Christmas break and he came up to me and he's like, I don't want you to be miserable here, man. Like, cause I wanted to play. Mm -hmm. Um, and I played a little bit in the beginning of the season. I had me and Ravante were both, led the orange and blue scrimmage and scoring to start the year. And I had it in my mind. I'm like, I'm gonna play 20 minutes a game this year. And you know what happened? Kendrick Nunn figured out the system. (laughs) And, and, and so I'm sitting there in the middle of my sophomore year and gross is like, if you want to go, man, like you got to do what's best for you. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's gonna be tough with Kendrick and it's gonna be tough with some of the guards we have coming in. And I just want to be honest with you. And now I stuck it out and graduated and was there four years but, you know, I appreciated that about him for, for doing that and, and leveling with me. And I think that's that's all the conversations that they're having this this week is like as real of conversations that you can get. And sometimes that, you know, what you don't want to do is lie. Yeah. Right. And be like, hey, no, 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 you're going to play 25 minutes a game. Like sometimes the best thing you can do is I don't know. You got to compete. I don't know. You got to compete. Yeah. Right? You got to figure that out. So, and the guys that will stay and compete are going to be better for it because they're giving themselves a chance to develop. Because when you bring in good guys and those guys compete every single day, everyone raises their level of play. So long winded answer there, but um, yes, college basketball has, has changed in that regard. I just want to go through some of these comments real quick. $5 super chat from Harold. Thank you, Harold. Appreciate that. Philip, who's the most important target this weekend? I don't like doing this because then people will take uh, offense to it. But for me, it's Kyle Boswell. Yeah, it is. I mean, yeah. we don't have to spend much time on that. It is. I don't think so. Boswell and Quincy are proof to never burn the bridge when you lose a recruitment. That, that's true on the football and basketball side here, Mike, is half of the prep recruiting now, it feels like it's just setting up that relationship uh, for the long-term transfer portal. Trey White. Yeah. Also, also a guy with an Illinois offer um, and a prior relationship there. I mean, that is – I, I mean, not to, I'm not bringing this back to my, to myself again, but when I transferred or when I was a graduate transfer, I went to familiarity and it was a staff in Scott Nagy and, and Brian Cooley who were at South Dakota state. They were my first offer in high school. And I just gravitated towards that familiarity because with familiarity comes trust and, and that that's uber important. So not, that's a great comment because burning bridges in this day and age, whether you're a coach, whether you're a player, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's huge. All right. We almost went an hour, so I'm not going to keep you anymore. We do have a film room coming up. Mike's going to break down Trey White. We're going to do those as uh, we go along here with uh, any commits that Illinois gets from the transfer portal. But thanks to almost 400 people here live on the YouTube channel. Hit that like button, subscribe to us, hit that notifications bell as well. If you're listening on the podcast, give us a follow rating review wherever you get your podcast. For Michael Tulip, I'm Jeremy Warner. Everybody have a great day. Take care of each other. We'll talk to you next time right here on the Online Enquirer podcast.